Well, thank you, Ruri, and thanks to IIEA and all of you for coming out uh, today. Uh, I am, as Ruri said, a virus extraction, although I haven't been here since 1970. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be back. My son is in his second semester at Trinity uh, and lives just down the road in Kavanaugh Court. So I had an easy walk over this morning. Uh, my father is a, a Daly from West Meath, and my mother is a McCarthy from Galway. And then it's all O'Connors and O'Hearns and everything all the way back. Uh, my wife is Chinese, however, so we're, we're, we've, we've stopped uh, just marrying other Irish Americans. I was recalling this morning in 1991 when I was a diplomat at the embassy, American embassy in Beijing, I went to a St. Patrick's Day party at the Irish embassy, which was right around the corner. And I actually hesitate to tell this story because it involves people who some of you doubtless know, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell it anyway. I was at the St. Patrick's Day party and uh, the at the time, Irish ambassador's daughter was visiting, uh, and I thought she was quite lovely, and I invited her to go with me the next morning to the Great Wall, and she said yes. So I set up with my, a good friend of mine who was a Chinese driver at the American Embassy to get the van, you know, to drive us out to the wall to have a day uh, up on the wall to have a hike, um, and I thought to have a date. And so the next morning I went to pick her up and she was there waiting to go to the Great Wall with me and her boyfriend, <laughs> who was also in town. And so I was sort of, I swallowed and was gracious and said, nice to meet you. And we had a very nice day on the wall. And when I got back to work on Monday morning, our driver had spread this story among our entire Chinese staff. And I was the laughing stock of the, the, the Chinese embassy because he realized uh, precisely what had happened. And so that was my first foray into U.S.-Irish-Chinese relations. This is my second, and I, I enter it just a little bit of trepidation uh, because of that prior experience. Um, the, the background to this topic is, of course, uh, China's fantastic rise over the past 40 years. And because much of what I'm saying today is going to have a cautionary character, I want to begin by stating the obvious that, that China's rise is in the main a, a great and historic human good, uh, which has involved the lifting out of poverty of 800 million people and has been conducive to human flourishing uh, within China and around the world. That is the background of a number of geostrategic concerns, but I think that we have to remind ourselves continually, especially in the United States, uh, that this comes about uh, because of a primarily positive story within China, uh, to which the United States has made a significant contribution of which we should be proud. We often lose track of that. The relationship has shifted. Uh, we saw this in 2017 when President Trump's first national security strategy said that China, together with Russia, but China primarily, is now our greatest long-term security challenge, that it is a greater threat, if that word has to be used, than threats from non-state actors and from terrorism. That's quite a striking statement. Uh, we then heard about two months later when then Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis rolled out the national defense strategy, which was, there's a national security strategy which is supposed to identify threats. The national defense strategy says, well, here's what we're going to do about it. Now, obviously, one of the problems with the dynamic is that it tends to shape our responses to threats primarily in military terms, um, be that as it may. The Secretary of Defense, Mattis, in outlining his defensive plans made, I thought, a striking statement, especially for a Secretary of Defense. He said, there's no ironclad rule that the United States has to prevail in this competition, but we must prevail, the Secretary of Defense, a Marine, Mad Dog Mattis said, we must prevail if the values of the Enlightenment are to endure. It's an interesting phrase from a military man, but it does put the, uh, um, a focus on the fact that there is an ideology, an ideological values component to this relationship. And I gather, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that this is, these sets of concerns were what lay behind the 2019 European declaration that China was, among other things, a systemic rival. Uh, and that, I think, re is a recognition of uh, the same fact that as China has grown more powerful, it has done what you would expect uh, the world's most populous, richest nation, which is also an ancient civilization and really sort of an empire uh, on its own terms has done. It's, it's, it's sought greater influence uh, 
And we find, as China influences uh, the peoples of the rest of the world, that it doesn't always treat them using different values than those which inform its treatment of its own people, and that's a problem for us. So that's where we find ourselves now. In the United States, there is a debate about how to frame this competition with China. We see, and I think that, um, I think that Beijing and, and Washington agree on this, although Beijing's uh, diplomatic discourse is more traditional uh, and sort of less bombastic than that of the United States. But we agree that the United States and China are involved in a very long-term, decades-long global competition that includes both poles, outer space and cyberspace, to have a leading influence on. I don't think either believes it can be a, a, a sole superpower in the way that the United States was briefly after the Cold War, but to be the leading shaper of security architectures, trade and investment regimes, very importantly, the development, marketization, and regulation of new technologies, but also norms and practices and value systems worldwide. That's the nature of the competition. The debate in the United States is between those who think that our policy should aim at managing this competition as well as we possibly can or winning it. Those are, those are broadly the, the speaking the two schools. The people who advocate for management and cards on the table, I'm, I am one such, uh, believe in managing this competition as well as possible in what is basically a play for time, which recognizes that China is a complex space, place which is still evolving, still changing. Xi Jinping, like most political leaders, speaks with great certainty about where he's going to take China and, and why. But in fact, like Deng Xiaoping, he's still crossing the river by feeling for the stones. They're, they're making this up uh, as they go along. But the, the managers say, let's manage the relationship as well as we can in a play for time. The growing number of voices, who may be a majority now, they're certainly the loudest in Washington, say, no, we have to win this competition. It cannot be a play for time because we're out of time. Engagement was a sucker's game in which we aided and abetted, enabled a small tiger, which is now a grown tiger, a pure competitor, an enemy, and we have to win. This is why you will hear more and more people like Steve Bannon or senators like uh, Ben Sass of Nebraska or Marco Rubio of Florida describing China as an existential threat. This term has gained a lot of currency over the past year. Uh, I'm in a, I think now, probably a minority group that will reject this term, uh, in part because the word threat remains perfectly serviceable and completely alarming. Uh, it means something that we need to attend to, study, prepare for. Uh, existential threat means pass the ammunition and reload. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we hear this. Senator Cotton of Arkansas has called China, hearkening back to Reagan, the evil empire. This kind of rhetoric is on the rise. Um, so just quickly, you know, what does, if we look at the policy proposals of people who advocate for prevailing, for winning in this competition, defeating China in this competition, you know, what, what does that mean? Well, it, it means the decoupling of vital industries. There's a question about whether that is possible. It is certainly very costly. It entails something like uh, industrial policy, emb the embrace of industrial policy for the United States with re relation to things like rare earths and other industries. It would certainly entail sending the Chinese students home. Uh, essentially, the United States telling the world's largest talent pool that it is a despised class within the United States. It is hard to imagine sending the Chinese students home without an attendant uh, racist backlash in the United States, frankly, against Chinese Americans. But I think this would have to be a piece of it. If we think back to the Cold War and the way that you know, the Soviet students at the time weren't welcome there, Playing to win would involve a diplomacy, a United States diplomacy, based on insisting that all of our partners and other nations choose sides between the United States and China. And we talked about this a little bit at lunch. Uh, this is a development that no nation welcomes. In Europe, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, both China and the United States have been doing a good deal of cajoling and pressure. Um, sometimes even many nations feel bullied behind screens requesting that, that they take sides, and they understandably do not wish to do this. Trying to win would also involve, I think, a spread of this notion of China as an, an evil empire. Perhaps there are very real values and ideological issues at play here, but they need to be contextualized 
more broadly than the evil empire kind of discourse makes them. That is nevertheless on the rise. And of course, China uh, in part is responsible for making this possible. Those of us who remain in a more moderate camp of wanting to manage relations, when you make these defenses in the United States, China does not help you. <laughs> when you advocate for moderation, you get Hong Kong, you get Xinjiang, you get Xi Jinping politicizing the universities, which have always politicized, but further politicizing China's universities and media and the creative class and locking up citizen journalists. All of the increasingly repressive moves that Xi Jinping is making make it much easier to make the evil empire claim and, and more difficult to make a more nuanced, gradualist, long-term claim. And then perhaps most worrisomely, when we speak of winning rather than managing this competition, uh, we're talking about a new arms race, which comprises not only uh, nuclear arms, but also cyber weapons and outer space weapons, neither of which we understand very well. And I'm afraid that Washington is very close to a re-embrace of something like a mutual assured destruction doctrine. We're not quite there yet, but this is where the momentum goes. And I know that there are similar concerns. Uh, we see them in Europe and Europe obviously has a different set of equities for reasons that you're more familiar with than I am. But I would suggest if you look back at the past five year or so history of growing concern about China in these in various ways, uh, Europe has tended to get in a somewhat more moderate, nuanced place. It's tended to agree with some of the United States concerns on a lag time of about two or three years. I see a broad pattern along those directions. I don't know whether you would uh, agree. So I think these issues, despite being an advocate for managing the relationship, the concerns about China are very real, but I think that they have been wrongly framed, and that's what I'd like to focus on in the remainder of the time. Uh, they tend to ignore a few extremely important factors which should shape our approach to China's rise, even our approach to China's power, and which cer certainly should inform our approach to international relations. My first worry uh, is about our assimilating capacity. What I mean by that is that the rise of China, I think, is the single most important geostrategic phenomenon in the world today. It's transformative. It requires a rethink across the board of all of our assumptions and all of our strategies. I, I, I believe that that is true. But China is, of course, the rise of China is not the only geostrategic, or the, not the only transformative challenge that humankind faces. There's the rise of China and the other nations as well. But of course, at the same time, we're facing the challenge of global warming and the loss of biodiversity, which is perhaps more alarming and is also transformative. And we shape transformative shifts of globalization, not only the globalization of supply chains, but the globalization of pathogens, of crime, the globalization of information, ideas, media, and entertainment, the globalization of rich, poor disparities, which is attendant with things like mass migration, and add to that another transformative dynamic, which is the emergence and confluence of new forms of technology, the impact and importance of which I don't think we've even begin, begun to understand yet. So if that's right, if we're really facing all of these truly transformative challenges at once, it's a little bit as though we experienced, sort of to pick historical parallels, the rise of the United States, the little ice age and disappearance of the dinosaurs, woodblock printing and the Gutenberg Bible, the Gilded Age and the Great Depression, the Black Death and the Industrial Revolution, and the discovery of the germ theory of disease worldwide within a 50-year period. So an exaggeration to make a point that we face a lot of transformative issues at the same time. And what I take from this, working on US-China, is we need to constantly remind ourselves, the United States and worldwide, that while China may be the greatest geostrategic challenge we face, it may well be the case that our greatest geostrategic challenge is not our greatest challenge overall, and that it needs to be contextualized in the light of others. Another issue that we miss in the United States with an overfocus on China as, for example, an existential threat is that China is constrained. Uh, the rise of China is new, sudden, uh, especially in the United States. You don't have this problem here. It threatens our own sense of self and our sense of preeminence. And that, you know, certain kinds of fears about American decline clearly shade in part our response to China. Beijing's propagandists would say that all of the American response to China is a hegemonic, paranoid response 
response, you know, fear of American decline. That is, is untrue, uh, but it would be also untrue to claim that it's not a factor. China is constrained. It's not 10 feet tall. It, it is not a monolith moving inexorably and unopposed in one direction. It's constrained geographically. It has 14 land neighbors. Only Russia has as many, four of which are nuclear, one of which is North Korea, one of which India it has major land disputes with. Just its 14 land bordering nations combined have greater military strength, economic wealth, and population than China. A difficult neighborhood, especially when you compare it to the United States. And that's before you add, add in China's maritime neighborhood and the constraints that it sees there, not only uh, with the Malacca dilemma and the, the fact that they're sort of bottled in in the Western Pacific, but America's alliance systems and the presence of uh, the United States military still in the Western Pacific. And many of these nations are, of course, strong. These are not, these are not weak nations. So China is constrained by geography. It is constrained on its own periphery. China speaks as though uh, it is now able, based on the success of its economic development, to exercise governance around the world. This is part of the Xi Jinping claim. Beijing has a model. Beijing wants to lead on global governance. But China is having real difficulty in governance on its own periphery. Okay, it has had 25 years to convince the people of Hong Kong that it is in their interest to be part of the PRC. No sale. It's going the other direction. It has had 70 years to convince the people of Xinjiang and Tibet and Taiwan that they should want to be part of this Chinese Communist Party-led family. 70 years, a stunning failure of policy in all three of these areas, which are in different ways on the Chinese periphery. It's going in the other direction. So again, China is constrained. It is constrained, too, by its unequal economic development. This, I think, not the United States. This is what Xi Jinping worries about first thing in the morning. This is what he has identified as the great outstanding contradiction is rising expectations in China in an area in which there's uneven development. And I think that from Xi Jinping's own point of view, he's correct about that. And this is really what he deals with most of the time and there's a great deal of uncertainty for him here. What else could sort of end the party in China and have it stuck in some sort of middle income tra trap swamp in which it can't move forward easily? Corruption. Xi Jinping's greatest admission remains an enormous problem within China. Debt, the debt bomb, especially among local government, could slow things down or bring development, uh, GDP growth it to a halt in China. Demographics, the fruits of the one China policy, getting old before you get rich with no good social safety net. This is an enormous policy problem uh, just on the horizon for China, and it knows it, and it's going to require expenditures and sacrifices which slow down China's growth. Pollution, you all know about this. You've read about air pollution in China. That one's relatively easily dealt with. Water, less easily dealt with. Nobody knows how to handle 80% of your lakes and rivers being technically dead. And even worse than that is soil pollution. Unprecedented in human history, overuse of nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers, uh, which a, a toxicity of the soil that can't be undone and that could again end all of this, as could China's water shortage in the north and as could China's sclerotic politics, the fact that you're still stuck with a revolutionary Leninist model that was applied to a desperately poor agricultural state, and that's no description of China today, which is dynamic and entrepreneurial and innovative and internationalist and forward-looking. How do you reconcile that? Um, and then lastly, I think that uh, we have tended to overstate the China threat in a number of ways. Um, we, we worry a lot uh, in the United States, as does a good deal of Europe, as does Australia, and much of the rest of the world, about China's influence, its ability to push its illiberalism beyond its own borders. Um, and I tell this story a lot, but it it's struck me deeply, and I think it remains the right question. My son, who's now a sophomore here at Trinity, around the corner, who I'm here visiting, a few years ago, we were out back doing yard work, and we were talking about U.S.-China relations. He said, Dad, you know, I hear you talk about this stuff all the time. It's one of the reasons he isn't joining us here today. He's kind of heard enough of his dad. Um, he said, when you talk about Chinese influence, he said, what do you mean? We're mulching the gardens, then we're going to go watch Avengers Infinity War, then we're going to get pizza, then we're going to come home and we're going to play cribbage uh, and drink Jameson's and listen to Bob Dylan. And China interferes in none of this. So what is this about? I think that you know, in America, here, other countries, there's got to be some version of this question, if you're looming China is gonna take over everything, and you walk outside and you say, well, 
what does this mean? We, we've overstated it. Um, but I think the best way, at least for Americans, to understand the, the, the threat from China is to say, OK, there is a challenge. Um, that's my preferred term. But threat, if you like. I won't quibble over that. Uh, but what is the nature of that threat? What list in any nation, Ireland, here, Ireland, the United States, what are the greatest issues that you're facing? And then ask yourself, how many of them are China's fault? The loss of jobs to automation, not China's fault. In the United States, the fact that we have let anger become the very engine of our politics and are, are, and are more deeply divided than we've been since the Civil War. Not China's fault. That's on us. The fact that CEOs now make 700 times the wage of a factory floor worker. Did China do that to us? No, that's on us. The fact that we incarcerate a higher percentage of and more of our people than any other country in the world, and most of them are poor people of color. Not China's fault. That's on us. You can go right down the list. The fact that whatever threat Huawei represents, I think it does represent a threat, the fact that the United States does not have a competitor for Huawei is not Huawei's fault. When we have Americans who say all Chinese students and we should send them home, the fact that there are not Americans prepared to take their position in all of these PhD programs in STEM, China didn't do that. That's on us. So I think that most Americans, whatever their idiosyncratic list of problems would be, if you went down and you say how many of these can be laid at China's door, how many of these sins, uh, the answer is not very many. So the United States hasn't really framed this issue correctly yet. We're still flailing between uh, raising the alarm about China, sometimes just through a sort of a brutal name calling, and responding coherently uh, with sustainable policies um, that would actually work for the United States. Now, having said that, I do think that there are major issues entailed in China's rise, uh, which are not in the, in and letting China have its head is not in the interest of the West, of the EU, of the United States. There are, there are real differences in interests that I think we have to face, and sort of, so two with reference to the United States, which I think have echoes for Europe. First is that we do not want China to have dominance in the Western Pacific. The United States can't seek dominance either. We can't exercise that anymore. Uh, but Chinese dominance in the Western Pacific, which China certainly seeks, is not in our interest. It would entail uh, giving up on our alliance system in the Western Pacific, which would almost certainly re result in a new nuclear arms race in Northeast Asia. Uh, Japan, if taken out of the American nuclear umbrella, would itself have to go nuclear, at which point South Korea would go nuclear. Taiwan could go nuclear very quickly. And then if we've got a nuclear North Korea, South Korea, Ch uh, China, Russia, India, Pakistan, uh, Japan, Taiwan, the lesson is that big nations go nuclear, so maybe add Indonesia to this list as well. It doesn't become a pretty picture. Uh, seed, seeding Western Pacific to Chinese dominance uh, would also entail giving up on the defense of international law for the United States. So our policy should aim to allow for China's growing influence, because China has legitimate interests in, in, in the area, uh, but avoiding through real forms of confrontation, if need be, China's dominance while not seeking it ourselves. And obviously, different versions of that formula might apply in different parts of the world. And then secondly, we have a very strong interest in avoiding the spread of Chinese illiberalism beyond China's borders. China likes to say that its foreign policy is non-ideological. It doesn't seek uh, to convert other countries, and it doesn't care what kinds of political systems those countries have. And in the first instance, there's a fair amount of truth in that. China is not seeking Lebensraum. This is not the Third Reich. This is not the Soviet Union that wants that kind of domination. And I think that China genuinely doesn't care if the United States or Ireland are democratic, again, in the first instance. However, the record that we see from China over the past 20 years strongly suggests that Countries which China see as receiving its largesse, especially in the form of infrastructure lending, not only infrastructure lending, but other, other areas as well. If you receive Chinese largesse, it turns out, although China generally doesn't ask questions about your political system when it issues those loans, it also doesn't necessarily ask if you can repay them, but that's a different issue you can talk about if you wish. Um, it turns out that if you get Chinese largesse, that you don't get to have an opinion about the Uyghurs. 
or the South China Sea or whatever else it may be. Uh, the Communist Party doesn't really brook obstacles. This is the goal, I would say, of Chinese foreign policy. It is not world domination. It is not spreading of Chinese ideology. Dependent, deference through dependence, broadly speaking, is the formula. Okay, not dominance, but deference through dependence, leveraging China's wealth to get other nations to be at least complicit, silent, in not placing any obstacles in the way of China's goals or its self-image. And we see this in numerous occasions. You know, Laos and Cambodia are essentially bought such that they prevent any uh, consensus within ASEAN, Greece, whose port of Piraeus is now being very ably run uh, by the Chinese, uh, is upsetting EU and other apple carts in, in opposing any sort of criticism of China. Italy, maybe that's not going so well. We'll see how its embrace of China's uh, overseas infrastructure lending goes, but certainly through the 17 plus one, uh, this is part of the game. Uh, and we, we need to fight that. And the way this works is if, you're, if you are a nation that, that takes certain kinds of Chinese lo lending or other kinds of largesse, uh, and if you have a free press, then you have to silence it. And if you have a vibrant civil society, it too can't criticize China. And so what this means is that while China doesn't care about exporting ideology directly, indirectly, the terms of Chinese deep economic involvement have the effect of silencing free press and civil society and therefore over time have the effect of an export of ideology or the spread of illiberalism. And I think that we do need to fight against that. Now, last remark. As I said, America hasn't decided. There's a struggle between those who think we can manage the, should manage the relationship in what's essentially a play for time. Time for China to change, but time for the United States to change as well. And then there are those who think that we need to win or predominate. I'm worried that that decision will not be made through a normal policy or political process. I worry because America is so strongly divided now and because our political discourse is so demeaned uh, and because Washington is way out ahead of the American people in its concern about these issues. I worry that our China policy will be set, again, not by a strate the kinds of strate strategic thinking that we'd hope would go into it, but by crisis. We're very prone to have the, the decision made by crisis. And there are crises of several sorts, any of which could swing this. There's the Sputnik crisis. China's doing something which helps America to realize that it's fallen behind and that it needs to improve its own game, strengthen America, and compete. The Sputnik crisis might not be a bad thing. Then there's the Suez crisis from London's point of view. A sudden crisis which forces all Americans to confront the fact that we're no longer the indispensable nation and that some of our powers of persuasion or our ability to shape the external environment to, our, as, you know, to meet our desires, maybe we can't do that anymore. Maybe something like a Suez crisis forces us to confront that. Then there's the Tiananmen crisis, something which puts the evil China narrative first and foremost, such that that gets broadly socialized and tilts over into a Cold War. And there are a number of places where you could have something like a Tiananmen crisis. There, some of them are playing out before us right now, especially in Xinjiang. And then, uh, perhaps most likely, the 9-11 crisis. 9-11, in this case, with reference to China, meaning a crisis which puts all of our attention and resources and energies into what is, in fact, a secondary geostrategic concern and has us taking our eye off the ball in China. And uh, we all look, with the assassination a few months ago, it looked like we might be going down uh, this kind of rabbit hole vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It's certainly not off the table yet. Then the fifth kind of crisis would be something like a collapse in China. I don't foresee this, I don't predict this. There are those who do, I think it's unlikely. But all the constraints that I mentioned, any of those could precipitate something like a China crisis, which takes this issue off the table for a while. And then lastly, to end on an optimistic note, although I'm not predicting this one either, there's a crisis of a different sort, which something like a pandemic could be, which reminds us that in fact, we have a great deal of common concerns and we really need to cooperate and therefore contextualize our growing animosity within the context of the joint need to solve common problems. Not putting my money on that one either.
Anyway, I will stop there. I very much want to hear uh, your own views. Uh, and any comments, uh, criticisms are, are, are most welcome. I'm, I'm here mostly to sort of hear your views and, and to, to challenge the American narratives, many of which aren't leading us in a positive direction. Thank you. Thank you.